Hello everybody and welcome to the virtual book launch for the new paperback edition, um, special commemorative paperback edition of my book Born Survivors. Uh, normally this would not be a virtual book launch but of course because of the pandemic uh, we are all in our uh, respective homes or both of us in our respective homes and I'm very very lucky today and fortunate enough to be joined um, by Eva Clark in Cambridge and she is one of the babies uh, about which I write. So hello Eva. Hello, hello. Welcome. Um, so the story of Born Survivors, for those of you who don't know, um, is that it tells the true story of three young mothers who hid their pregnancies from the Nazis and gave birth in the camps in really unspeakable circumstances. And they're known as the Miracle Babies because it's an absolute miracle that they all survived, as did their mothers, and went on to lead full and happy lives. Um, it's an extraordinary book that uh, I was fortunate enough to come across the story and I'll tell you about how that happened in a wee while. Um, but it's really been something that's been quite remarkable since it was first published in uh, 2015. Um, we've had an incredible experience, myself particularly, but um, with Eva and the other two babies, Hannah and Mark, who both live in America. Um, it's been an unexpected, uh, warm, global reaction to the book now published in 22 countries and translated into 16 languages. And really for the last five years, uh, we've been traveling, haven't we, Eva? We've been just about everywhere. Um, we've been all over the world talking to uh, all sorts of uh, different people from the US Senate to the House of Lords, to schools, to synagogues, to embassies, um, to museums, to synagogues. Um, and actually we even went to the uh, Edinburgh Festival, Eva. Tell us about that. Uh, yes, in, uh, we went to the Edinburgh Festival to see a ballet which is called Anchor's Story and certainly neither my mother nor I ever dreamt that her story could be told uh, through the form of a ballet and it, the, the launch of it was in Cambridge. It was put on by uh, Hills Road Sixth Form College Ballet Group uh, and shall I tell the story of yes. my mother's reaction? Um, when she heard about it, she was very pleased and the uh, uh, ballet school wanted to put it on the week of her 95th birthday. And we went to the premiere, and she, but she was very worried because ballet was not her thing. And she said to me, I'm bound to fall asleep. It's going to be dark. It's going to be warm. There's going to be beautiful music. How could I not fall asleep? But she didn't. And she was t we were both totally riveted. And it was absolute, it was just so moving. And that was, that was back in um, 2012. And then uh, last year, the school decided that they wanted to put, go to the Edinburgh Festival again. And so uh, I went up again and supported them. And it was, it was so moving. Everybody yes, was in fact, tears, must, I think. Yes, you must have seen it three times, in fact, because you, I went with you at one point and we yes, were in, yes. in floods as well. So it's Yeah, that's right. And every year on January 27, Holocaust Memorial Day, we mark uh, the day in all sorts of special ways. Um, you've always done so, um, but I have done that more recently since the book came out and, and been very thrilled to have been invited to some extraordinary events, but really none more extraordinary than this year on January 27. Uh, tell, tell us about that. Uh, as Wendy says, Holocaust Memorial Day is commemorated in most parts of the world, I think, on the 27th of January, because that was the day that Auschwitz was liberated by the Russian army. And the Nash, there's a national event as well as local events, but the national event always takes place in London. And this year it was in the Westminster Central Hall in London. And Wendy came with me and also with uh, my elder son, Tim. And it, it was, a, I had a great honor because there were, well, I was one amongst 12 survivors who was invited to light a candle in memory of the six million. And, uh, and the VIP candle lighters, I have to say, were Prince William and Kate. And Prince William spoke extremely movingly about his great grandmother, Princess Alice of Greece, who had in fact hidden a Jewish family in Athens during the war. And after the war, she was proclaimed as a righteous Gentile. 
uh, and yes, it was just a, a remarkable event, a very moving event. So many people spoke, there were a lot of survivors present, uh, and also survivors of, of other genocides as well. And you were able to tell uh, Prince William about another meeting that you'd had for HMUK. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yes, afterwards, um, we had a sort of a semi-private audience with Prince William and Kate, the 12 of us, and at one point I said to him, that the last time I had been honored to be a candle lighter for this particular event, that was with my mother as well, and she was also a candle lighter, and that was on the 60th anniversary of the liberation, uh, and that is when we met his grandmother, um, the Queen, and I feel that that was sort of posh networking. <laughs> Very much so. Now, of course, if it weren't for the pandemic, we would be on a plane on Friday traveling to Vienna at the invitation of the Austrian authorities. The reason uh, we would be going to Austria is because you were not only born at the gates of the camp Mauthausen, but you were also liberated from there as well. And just to fill uh, people in, if they haven't uh, been aware of the story, um, the three babies were born um, en route basically to Mauthausen to be executed. Um, the mothers were among a thousand women who had been in slave labor, having been in Auschwitz, having been in the ghettos and, uh, and uh, camps uh, around Eastern Europe. Uh, and uh, they went on a 17 day trade journey with hardly any food or water. Uh, as the commandant, the SS commandant was looking for a concentration camp that was still open in April 1945 that would be open and ready to take this uh, group of women and I think something like two to three thousand other people attached to the end of that long snaking train of death as it went down through Czechoslovakia um, and uh, it was there that uh, they were liberated ultimately thank goodness and we're going to be hearing about Eva's birth a little later on but in any event, we would have been on a flight to, uh, to Vienna on Friday, uh, and as we were five years ago this week, uh, when we went to Vienna to launch Born Survivors in the first place, uh, and had a very moving and emotional time there. And it was really extraordinary um, because the president of Austria was there, all three babies were there, all of whom you'd all just recently celebrated your birthdays on April 12th, April 20, and April 29. Uh, and he presented you with a large birthday cake and, and led the singing of happy birthday. And I, I couldn't help but stand back and think, what would Hitler have thought that the president of Austria was singing happy birthday to three Jewish babies? Uh, and you had different, slightly different thoughts, I think. Yes, I, I couldn't, uh, I kept thinking, and what would our three mothers be thinking? What an irony it was. Absolutely. And we're very, very sorry that we can't be there for this important 75th uh, celebration and, and especially when we have this commemorative edition coming out. Um, but uh, we will be going back and we will be marking it quietly in our own uh, way uh, on, on that weekend. Um, now, I just want to tell people how I first came across the story, which um, you, as people will gather, uh, listening to this and those who've read the book will know um, that there's so much luck involved in the survival of the mothers and the babies. And there's also a great deal of luck for, for me because I first came across the story by luck, by chance, reading something late at night online about a woman who'd died in Canada uh, in her 80s and she had been in Auschwitz and had given birth to a baby there and the baby had been taken away and killed. And she'd had to live with that tragedy her whole life. And it struck me that I'd never read anything about babies being born in camps who had survived. And I just assumed, of course, that they hadn't. But I decided to start looking and um, about 10 pages into Google, I came across the name Eva Clark and read about her story and her mother's story and realized she was British and, and, and looked on Amazon and there were no books uh, written about her. And I thought, my goodness, this is an amazing story. I'd so love to be able to tell it. And honestly, Eva, if you'd lived in, in Australia at that point, I'd have jumped on a plane to find you. But my second piece of luck was that you live in Cambridge and I live in Suffolk. So we are an hour and a half apart. Uh, and I was able to find you and you very kindly invited me to your home. And I came for the day and I think it's fair to say we, we made an immediate connection, a very emotional connection. It was a very moving and beautiful day together. And at the end of it, when you'd told me your mother's story, because of course I'd just missed her by a few months. She died at 96 eight, in 2013. Um, but uh, I, I asked you at the end of the day, if you would do me the very great honor of letting me 
right to your mother's story and you reached out and, and touched my arm and, and told me you've been waiting for me for almost 70 years which was just beautiful and I was very very moved and I told you I believed your story to be unique I hadn't found any other babies that had survived but then you told me something different tell me about that and how you came to find out there were two others well, yes, for most of my life, my mother and I had thought that I was the only baby to have been born, certainly to have been born before liberation. Uh, and then in, um, when my mother was liberated by the American army in Mauthausen, afterwards she said to me that hundreds, and she didn't tend to exaggerate, she said hundreds of the photographs of us were taken by the American GIs, but I had never managed to find a single one. And I'm sure that they probably exist in somebody's, you know, shoebox in somebody's attic. And I went through all the normal channels that you could think of. And in the end, um, but only a few years ago, I wrote, I found out that it was the 11th Armored Division of the American Army that had liberated the camp. I wrote to their Veterans Association. I enclosed a four generation photograph um, of my mother, myself, my younger son, and uh, my first uh, grandchild, Matilda. And I sent this to them. And a few months later, um, they sent me their sort of quarterly magazine, and it had our photograph on the front. And I had put the caption, you know, without you, none of us would exist. And two pages in, I find the story of Hannah. And I I said to my mother, I don't believe this. And she said, no, I don't believe it either. And because of wonderful, you know, 21st century communications or 20th century, well then, um, we managed to uh, get in touch via email very quickly. And then a few months later, Charlie, one of Mark's sons, he also went onto the internet trying to find more information about his father's um, origins or birth. Uh, and he also came across um, my name and possibly Hannah's as well. And so we were all uh, emailing at that stage. And then we decided, this was uh, 2009, we all decided that in 2010 we would all go to Mauthausen because it was going to be the last time that the veterans were going um, there. And we wanted to thank them, basically. Yes, because they were all dying. Yeah, they, they were all very elderly, and I think Hannah had already met some of them, but I certainly hadn't. And so we all went there in May of um, 2010, when we were all celebrating our 65th birthday. Uh, and we all met, and it was extremely emotional, and we laughed and cried the whole time. And then the following year, I, I was a bit cheeky, and I said to them, I asked them if they would be think about coming to Cambridge for Holocaust Memorial Day at the end of January, and they both immediately said yes and they came for about 48 hours I think um, in order to meet my mother because by that stage both their mothers had died of old age but they had died and they very much wanted to meet my mother and as it happens we're all only children so we now feel as though we have siblings and Wendy is our honorary little sister. Um, <laughs> very honest of you so. So they, they, the other two, Hannah and Mark, they came into the house and and my mother just said, you're my children. And Lovely. it was just remarkable. And the great sadness, of course, is that none of the mothers knew about the other mothers and they would have been undoubtedly helped and supported yeah. had they known, yeah. as they were hiding their pregnancies, as they were all being starved and almost worked to death, going down to five stone in weight and hiding their small bumps under baggy clothing, to have known that there are other women pregnant there at the same stage as they were, were mm. individually must have been an enormous help and uh, it would have been a lovely, um, lovely thing for them. And, and much more amazingly, of course, when you were all born weighing under three pounds and incredibly sickly, uh, you all turned out to be healthy in mind and body. I mean, um, no disabilities, mental or otherwise, as far as I can gather. <laughs> no, well, yeah. I mean, that's debatable, but no, <laughs> apparently. But you, you know that uh, something that I think it was Rachel who said, um, that was Mark's mother, she said that she had vaguely heard about another pregnant woman, but apparently her reaction was, yeah, but she would never have survived. Yes, yes, because it just it was such a miracle. Each individual birth appeared to be such a miracle to everybody around and especially to the mothers. So the idea of 
any of you surviving and, and you've really had no uh, long lasting effects. The only thing I can find, uh, I mean, the mothers suffered with losing teeth and the old hair went white because they sucked all the calcium out of them, giving mm. you the little milk that they did have. Incredible, they had milk at, at five stone. Mm. Um, but uh, the common denominator of all you three seems to be a bit spurious and that's that you're both highly alert, all three highly allergic to insect bites and none of you can, can bear loud noises. Uh, tell us about when you were a toddler. Yes, uh, when we we eventually came to live in this country, my mother, my stepfather, myself, and I was very young. I, I didn't go to school yet. I think I was, I don't know, something around five or six. And when my mother took me um, to the shops or whatever, uh, and if we passed um, workmen wor working with pneumatic drills in the road, I would have, she said, hysterics. Uh, because of the noise and she would always have to either ask the men to stop or she'd have to put her hands over my ears and uh, anyway you know this went on for some time it didn't last too long but I don't know how long but anyway much much later when my mother was suffering from uh, an illness called Munoz disease which is an illness of the the middle ear the balance in the middle ear and she went to an ear nose and throat specialist and he was a bit mystified because he said, well, the people who usually get this are either miners, uh, coal miners or steel workers or pop stars. And he said, well, you obviously don't fit any of those categories. And, and then she told him about having worked in the slave labor factory where it was very noisy because they were riveting. Uh, and, and she mentioned my aversion to uh, these pneumatic drills and he said, yes, he said it was the vibration. That was the yeah. reaction. Because these machines, I mean, these were wealthy to do, well-educated, lovely uh, young women who'd never had to do a day's work in their lives. And suddenly they were forced to work 12 hours a day, seven days a week, riveting the wings of this aircraft, these huge heavy machines that took two of them to carry with no ear defenders, nothing else. And the vibrations going through them and through you would have been extraordinary. So it's not surprising that you, you have that. Um, and of course, uh, you know, they, they were able to um, survive on, on largely a diet of water, so-called coffee for breakfast, which was a horrible metallic tasting uh, drink, uh, so-called soup for lunch, which if they were lucky, they might have a little slice of potato or onion or small piece of black bread that often had creatures in it. Uh, and then uh, coffee again in the evening. And, and of course, you know, women these days would be on folic acid and iron tablets and be, be worrying about all that. And I think your mother was a little schizophrenic about that when you were pregnant, wasn't she? Yes, she was. When I was expecting my uh, first son, Tim, um, she would say, now, are you having your calcium? And are you having your iron tablets? And are you having your vitamin C and all of this? And then in the next breath, she'd say, ah, you don't need any of this. <laughs> and of course, really what, uh, what kept you alive and probably her as well was a glass of milk. And yeah. just to explain the background a little bit of that on this hellish train journey that the, the, the train was uh, snaking down through uh, Eastern Europe, down to Austria. Um, they were forced to stop in a little town in Czechoslovakia called Horny Rija, uh, because the tracks ahead had been bombed by the Allies. So they needed the, to wait until the tracks were repaired by, by the Germans and the locals that they'd enlisted to help them. And it meant that they were stuck there for two days. And this extraordinary station master, Mr. Antonin Pavlicek, risked his life to challenge the SS commandant when he realized that this was a terrible human cargo. Uh, 36 bodies were thrown off the train like so much rubbish. And uh, the other people, they couldn't tell if they were men or women, they were shaven headed, they were incredibly thin, they were very, very frail and very ill. And he rallied the townspeople and overnight they baked 3000 bread rolls at a big factory where they had a big canteen. They all rallied together and made huge pots of potato soup and everybody got a little something if they were near the station. Um, but uh, tell us what happened with Anchor at that place. Well, my mother actually had no idea that they had stopped in a station because she was um, probably in one of the very last um, coal wagons. And she always said that she thought it stopped in the middle of the countryside. Anyway, um, when uh, during the time that they were there, uh, a farmer walked by and he saw her and he had such a shock. She always said she can never forget the expression on his face. She described herself as looking like a scarcely living pregnant skeleton. As Wendy's mentioned, none of the mothers weighed more than five stone at that stage. 
Anyway, this farmer brought her a glass of milk, but there was a Nazi officer standing near her and he had a whip and he raised this whip to shoulder height as if to beat my mother if she accepted the glass of milk. But he didn't. He didn't say anything. He lowered his arm and he let her have the glass of milk. She maintained that saved her life. Who knows? Perhaps it did. And the train went on. Mm. And tell us what happened then. Um, well, the train went on and it eventually arrived in this place called Mauthausen. Mauthausen itself is a beautiful village on the banks of the Danube in Austria near Linz. The concentration camp was up the very, very steep hill behind the village. And when my mother saw the name Mauthausen at the station, she had such a shock. Because as opposed to when she'd arrived in Auschwitz, not knowing what that was, this time she knew because she had heard about this appalling place from very early on in the war. And she always said that she thought that it probably possibly provoked the onset of her labor. And she started to give birth to me on that open coal wagon. She had to climb off it unaided. She had to climb onto a cart because the prisoners who were not strong enough to walk up the hill to the camp, they had to get onto carts and they were pulled up by others. She had people lying all over her, people with typhus and typhoid fever. And she proceeded to give birth to me. And there was another Nazi officer who saw that she was in the throes of child labor and he said to her, you can't survive the shrine, which means you can carry on screaming because presumably she had been. And she always said that she was screaming not only because she was in labor, but because she thought this was her very last minute on this earth. She thought she was about to die. But we both survived the experience. I was born, I didn't move, I didn't breathe. Incredibly, the Germans allowed a doctor to come to my mother a doctor who was also a prisoner, and presumably they allowed it because they could hear the guns in the distance. And the doctor came and he cut the umbilical cord and he smacked me to make me cry, to make me breathe. And there are three reasons why we survived. And the first is a very chilling one. On the 28th of April, 1945, the Nazis had run out of gas, the gas chamber. My birthday is the 29th. So presumably had the train arrived on the 26th or 27th, I wouldn't be here today. The second indirect reason why we survived is because on the 30th of April, Hitler committed suicide. And the last and the best reason why we survived is because on the 5th of May, the American army liberated the camp. My mother reckons she wouldn't have lasted much longer. Yeah, and I'm sure that's true. And I'm sure there were others that didn't last that long. Yeah. It was so much luck and so much timing. I mean, if they just hadn't, hadn't stopped at Horny Breezer yeah. for those two days, uh, if they hadn't, if they'd come, come to Auschwitz earlier on, they would have gone straight to the gas chambers. But they went at a time when the Germans needed uh, people for slave labor, including young, fit, healthy women. Um, extraordinary, extraordinary things. A lot of people ask us, don't they, if uh, we think that the, the, the baby survived because uh, the, you know, the mothers were so desperate to, to keep them alive because they, had, they were carrying these secret babies. But of course, everybody wanted to stay alive for yeah. all sorts of different reasons. And they just weren't lucky uh, in the way that your mothers were. Yeah. Um, it's just been such a life-changing experience for us all. But um, I think one of the things that's most unusual for me has been having to go into schools and talk to children, which I never had to do before. And that's been eye-opening for me. Of course, for you, you're an old hand. Uh, you've been in education all your life. And since your retirement, and I say that in quotes and laughing, uh, you work tirelessly for the Holocaust Educational Trust in Britain and go to schools all over the country. And now you and I do it together. Uh, and in fact, just before the pandemic, we spoke to hundreds of, of school children in, in the home counties. Um, listening to you tell that story just now as i listen to it so often it still gives me the chills and when we tell it to children the teachers say they've never seen anything like it they can you can hear a pin drop mm -hmm. um and we're so um grateful that the book's been adopted on the curriculum in so many schools around the world because it's a, it's an opportunity for children to understand what happened they can't possibly identify with six million dead but they can uh, identify with uh, with three young mothers but another thing that's been a revelation to me is out of the mouths of babes, these extraordinary questions um, that some of the children have. And you've had, you've had the odd uh, strange question or, or an unusual question that you've had to find an answer to, haven't you? Well, I, I'm not sure if you're referring to the why question or the faith question. Both, both really. Both, okay. Well, uh, many years ago I was in a school and although I, I don't speak to children younger than 13 or 14, uh, this was a, a, a boy, but I think he was quite a sort of a young 
13 year old. And he asked me uh, at the end of my talk, he said to me, why? And I said to him, you know, I've lost my train of thought. No, he asked you what if you met Hitler. Oh, what, what I would say. What would you ask him? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes, that's right. What What would I say uh, if I met Hitler? And I said to the boy, um, why? And he thought I was asking him yes, yes. why he was asking me. And I said, no, all I would say would be why? Exactly. Why? Exactly. Sorry about that. No, no. Um, and what was the other thing I was going the to say? The girl who asked you if you ever smiled. She Sorry? Said, the girl who asked you if you ever smile, if you ever oh, really yeah. smile. Yeah, that was very poignant. And, and you know, I'm, I'm so fortunate in every aspect of my life. I've had a very happy, secure life. And my mother did as well, growing up and certainly post-war. Uh, and she would have always described herself not as a Holocaust survivor, but as a, a, a wife, a mother and a grandmother. And um, eventually she was so pleased to be a great grandmother. Yes, and so optimistic. And that was the loveliest thing. They were all so shiny and life enhancing and optimistic in, in their different ways and great senses of humour. And uh, much more importantly, they instilled in all of you a sense of, of embracing life, it, it, you know, taking this opportunity that you've had that so many others didn't have and that you're able to, to sort of do something meaningful with your lives, which you've all done extraordinarily. I mean, Hannah is a chemist and she's spent her life um, testing uh, drugs for sort of life-saving drugs, which is ironic because, of course, she was one of the first ever civilians to be saved by penicillin by the American army uh, when she was so poorly when she was found in the camp. Um, Dr. Mark is a doctor, an emergency doctor. He trains emergency doctor. He does great charitable work and you have devoted your life to the latter part of your life to, to Holocaust education. I mean, in, incredibly valuable contribution to society. Um, and of course, we, we are talking about this in times when it's a very important thing to be telling the next generation about in terms of what's happening in the world, not, not the pandemic, but in terms of refugees. Um, mm -hmm. And you say something lovely to the children, which always has a resonance as well. Well, one of, one of the things that I um, talk about is that when we first came to this country, that although we came legally, we might have come as refugees, we might have come as asylum seekers, or we might have come as migrants. And I think it is so important that the lessons that we learned from the Holocaust, they have all to do with um, tolerance and respect for everybody, anybody. Uh, and, and we should also be grateful that everybody is different. It'd be pretty boring if we were all the same. Absolutely. And um, so lovely to, uh, to to be able to talk to you today. Um, and you really, you know, the most extraordinary thing to me is that in a few years time, you three babies will be the last living survivors um, of the Holocaust on the planet. Um, you know, all the events we go to, the survivors are getting older and frailer and, and mm. you know, just unfortunately falling away. And, and you will be there. You, you are the voices of the voiceless. And it's extraordinary um, that we are able to uh, to take you around and, and, and have you, um, I mean, people are so humbled by meeting you and they, they say that it's life changing. They, they feel they can never complain about anything again. And I know I certainly feel that. And I, I'm, I'm extremely fortunate to have found you. I'm extremely fortunate to call you my friend. And so, so are we to have found you or that you found us? <laughs> well, <laughs> bless you. and it's been a fantastic thing. So I hope you've enjoyed our chat today, everybody. Um, Born Survivors, the special new edition with a new oh, material. Wait, 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 wait a minute. <laughs> I've got my copy <laughs> here too. <laughs> uh, is out on uh, April 30th this year, available for pre-order now. Um, and the audio version actually has a conversation similar to this that Eva and I recorded as well. Um, so I, I do hope uh, you're able to, um, to buy this edition or recommend it to other people. And um, very good book club conversation uh, stopper, for sure. Conversation starter, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you very much indeed. And uh, be safe and be well. Thank you. Thank you.